ladies and gentlemen, Lord Heseltine has very kindly said that he will take some questions, so perhaps if I very quietly, you know, David Dim will be over here. If you just raise your hand, then I just pass you straight over to Lord Heseltine. Any questions? My name is David Miles. Uh, good evening, Lord Heseltine. Thank you very much for a very uh, interesting speech. Uh, I was going to ask you about the, I suppose, any party really, coming up to a general election. They produce a manifesto which they say that we must vote in order to um, get the next party into Parliament. But nobody seems to, uh, nobody seems to actually adhere to the manifesto that they have produced. Uh, do you think that possibly these manifestos ought to have some sort of legal backup in order for them to speak the truth rather than just tell us what they think we ought to know? Well, I, I'm afraid I, I challenge your premise. Um, I have been involved in drafting manifestos and serving in cabinets long enough to know that prime ministers care very much about their ability to defend them from that accusation. And within probably six to 12 months of an election, a message or a letter will come round from number 10 saying, send a report how your department's commitment to the manifesto read and what you have achieved and what you're going to do. And that will happen. And I think probably, I've been a of government I've been a member of, but I'm sure it happens under all governments because the, that every Prime Minister is going to be asked that question. You, did, you didn't say, or you did say, or what have you done? So I, I, I think that they do um, very determinedly want to defend their record. Of course, where you could have asked the second question, which is always more worrying than the first, is yes, but did they design the manifesto in language, which means that it is fairly opaque, or vague, or ambiguous? open to different interpretations. Well, we've got to win elections, we are politicians, and, and we can't deal with complex issues in simple language often. So uh, the, I understand your suspicion, but the, I, I'm afraid if I had to produce chapter and verse, I think I'd be able to show you that people do fulfill manifestos broadly. My Lord, a tough one, if I may. Are you the best Prime Minister we never had? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never made any secret of it. I'd like to be the Prime Minister. Uh, they're all different. They're all bringing up everything. I, um, I'd like to have done it. And uh, I, it would have ended in failure. They all ended in failure. <laughs> <laughs> stay there long enough to make any great impact, or you stay there so long that you've got so many enemies and such a cynical the fact is I said in my speech. The, um, you only have problems that uh, others can't solve. Now, I happen to think that David Cameron has got off to a first class start, that's yeah. my own view, and, and, and I stick with it. Um, but, but it's early days. And, they were famous, I think, Rumsfeld's statement, you don't know what you don't know. It's the unknowable, unknowable. Or, or Macmillan, because there's nothing new in politics. I mean, Rumsfeld Drum, put it quite well. But um, Macmillan, events, dear Lord, events. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right, Lord Hesler, just like, a couple of questions. Sorry, I'm David Weston, Bromsgrove. I left in 1977. Um, so you're a figure that was very much in the forefront as I looked at the political world as, as a young man. And, and I've just got two questions. One, uh, if you'll if you, uh, entertain them. One, one is, you, you are somewhat um, unusual in comparison with the politicians that, that one sees entering the fray today in that you have extensive um, experience and success uh, in the private sector um, prior to becoming um, a high profile public figure in, in the public sector. And what is it that made you 
want to um, to act in that field where it is actually, I would argue, a lot harder to get things done than, than, than perhaps in the private sector. And the other, the other, the, the sort of corollary to that question, um, a lot of the young politicians I meet today have never uh, acted uh, and worked in industry and in the private sector. There is a whole generation of the political class coming up through the system at Westminster that seem woefully disconnected um, from the real economic um, entity or the real economic uh, way of life in, in the UK. And, and, and how do you see that unfolding and playing out? Is, is that a desirable state of affairs? And what can we do to get a greater degree of, of connectedness between the private and public sectors going forward? Well, in, in, in my personal point of view, I want it to be financially independent. And um, that was quite a clear objective. I, I wanted to make enough money so that I could say what I thought, behave as I believed, and nobody could, could exert a financial pressure on me. That was the strategy, and that was how it happened. And uh, considering 86 to 90, that's a very good judgment that I made. Um, uh, your second very substantive point is about the increasing professionalism of the candidates that are coming through. And I personally think it's a pity. Um, it, it's more to do with selection committees than it is anybody else. They choose them, you know. And in the end, this is a democracy. And uh, I mean, a lot of them are very smooth, articulate people. I mean, that's the truth of the matter. So they get chosen. And, it's also true, I think, that people who get into the commercial world, the commercial world, they begin to go up the ladder and they begin to get um, advances and higher salaries and career satisfactions and potential opportunities. They don't want to give it all up for what could be a very short-term opportunity. I mean, the average life of a member of parliament in parliament is 10 years. And, you know, if, given that it's quite hard to get a safe seat you start with the marginal seat and, and you, you'd be lucky to hold it um, for, well, you'd, you know, you'd be lucky to hold it, that's the truth of it. I mean, I, I fought Coventry North in uh, 64, yeah, 64. If I'd won Coventry North, which I didn't, it would have been, I'd been out again four years later. So it's, you can see why in this increasingly professional world, where specialism matters, where, where people work hard and have to pursue careers, and where the competition is tough and where there's no hiding place, you can see why it's quite hard to get people to come from the sort of sector that I think you've got in mind when asking the question. And equally, there are now the growing phenomenon of the researchers, the political researchers, the young, the young graduates who become you know, assistants, special advisors, and God knows what. And they graduate up through that into being candidates into Parliament. I think it's a pity, but it's it is happening, and I I, I, I don't know what you can do about it except get the selection conferences to do something different. Well, time. I'm Ruth Leggett from Stroke School Government and fellow South Wales. So I'd like to ask you how important do you think it is that we take back the learning and experience that we've had back to our roots? Those of us who moved away. Uh, well, I never took it back to my roots. <laughs> but I did take it back to them. And you could say that as a sort of act of conscience. I mean, that's <coughs> got a statement. But the fact is that, uh, without any doubt, my background in Swansea was, is a formative part of my experience. I mean, I come from a privileged commercial background, but I drove through the Swansea Valleys week after week after week, uh, as did Jeffrey Howe, who I think would make exactly the same answer as I did. So there was poverty, stark and, and evident and all around. Um, so uh, I, I'm a one nation in terms of I believe in all this about paternalism, <coughs> no less of age and the responsibilities of privilege and, and all of that. Um, I, I'm not a lazy fair capitalist not to the right of the Tory party. Uh, unapologetic. 